Hare Krishna, dear devotees, my humble obeisances to you all. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Um, I welcome everyone to His Holiness, Chandramauli Swami Maharaj's daily class. Thank you all for joining. Um, today we are going to continue with the Srimad Bhagavatam series of first canto, 13th chapter, Sridharashtra quits home, verse number 18. Hare Krishna Maharaj, my humble obeisances to you all. Shri Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Oh, oh, good. Good. Please don't know. My obeisances to you and everyone. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Guru Star Ravi Pritya. This Vayukarastam Abhasata Rajanidam Yatam Smigram Asidam Bayam Agatam Translation Mahatma Bidur knew all this and therefore he addressed Peter as and saying, My dear king, please get out of here immediately. Do not delay. Just, have, just see how Peter has overtaken you. Little Papa, very detailed report in uh, report. Real death cares for no one, for none. Either Dhritarashtra or even Maharaj Judas. Therefore, spiritual instruction that was given the old Dhritarashtra was equally applicable to the younger Maharaj Judas. As in the, a matter of fact, everyone in the royal palace, including the king and his brother and mother, were rapidly attending the lecture. But it was known to be Dura and that his instructions were especially meant for Dita Rasta, who was too materialistic. The word Raja is especially addressed to Dita Rasta significantly. Dita Rasta was the eldest son of his father, and therefore, according to the law, he was to be installed on this name as a sinner for him. But because he was blind from birth, he was disqualified after the death of Pandu, his younger brother. His younger brother left behind him some minor children. Dhritarashtra became the natural guardian of them. But at heart, he wanted to become the factual king and hand the kingdom over to his own son, set up by Diodhana. With all these imperial ambitions, Dhritarashtra wanted to become a king and he contrived all sorts of intrigues in consultation with his brother-in-law, Shakuni. And everything failed by the will of the Lord. In the last days, even after losing everything, men and money, he wanted to remain as king, being the eldest uncle of Maharaj Yudhisthira. Maharaj Yudhisthira, as a matter of duty, maintained Dhritarashtra in royal honor, and Dhritarashtra was happily passing away his number of days in the illusion of being a king of the royal uncle of King Yudhisthira. Vidura, as a saint and as a duty bound affecting younger brother Dhritarashtra, wanted to awaken Dhritarashtra from his slumber of disease and old age. Vidura therefore sarcastically addressed Dhritarashtra as the king, which he was actually not. Everyone is servant of eternal time. Therefore, no one can be king in this material world. King means the person who can order. The celebrated English king wanted to order time and time, but the time and time refused to obey his order. Therefore, one is a false king in the material world. And Dieter Rastro was particularly reminded of his false position the factual fearful happenings which had already approached him at that time. Vidura asked him to get out immediately if he wanted to be saved from the fearful situation which was approaching him fast. He did not ask Maharaj Yudhisthira in the same way because he knew that the king, like, like the, the king like Maharaj Yudhisthira, is aware of all the fearful situations of this flimsy world and would take care of himself in due course, even though Vidura might not be present at the time. Only Gansamit Andasya Gyananjana Sarakai. 
Jaksun Militam Yenatas Mai Shri Gurudevi Maha Ma Om Vishnu Padayan Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Vimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Kinamani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Charine Nirvase Sasun Yavadi Pasyaki Ade Satarine Panchakalpa to this Chakripa, Sindhube, the Chapitanam Pavane, Yo, Vaishnavi, Yo, and the Holy Mother. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya, the Wounded Nanda, who had read the Gadahar, Sivasani, or Mother Linda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare. Just one minute and I'll return very quickly. So I'm working with that yeah. Hmm. So the word sadhu refers to a holy man or a person who has dedicated their life in worship of the Supreme Lord. But sadhu has a second meaning, which is the characteristic of a holy person. And sadhu means to cut, cut away people's material attachments. So they speak. When they speak, they speak according to Shastra, according to spiritual knowledge. And therefore, they don't patronize anyone's whimsical ideas just to somehow let it be known as popular amongst people. They're not out for popularity, they're out for truth. And sometimes they speak a little strong and becomes very difficult for people to accept it because it gets to the core of their attachment. And people like their attachments, although the attachments are not helping them, still they are attached. This is uh, the nature of the material world. People are attached to the wrong thing, but still they can't give it up. They won't give it up. And therefore, the preachers, the sadhus, the saints, the gurus, speak in such a way as to remind them what their real duty is and how they can find success in life. Uh, Dita Rastra, he's living like a household dog. He's simply taking the remnants of Bhima. And he, the people he tried to kill are now maintaining him. He has no shame. He has no character. And so um, Vidura is his younger brother. But Vidura is, wants to help his older brother. Therefore, he's getting right to the point that if you stay here any longer, you will experience something very horrible. In other words, you will die in an untimely way and be forced to enter into a hellish situation. Yudharastra committed so many sinful activities against the Pandavas by trying to kill them through his sons, Diodhana and others. And he committed many great offenses. But still, they were family members. You'll see that when one becomes avaricious, greedy for something material, one becomes blind to all good understanding or good sensibility and even tries to kill or uproot or destroy people who interfere with their desires. We have the example of 
Aurangzeb, the powerful Mughal leader, who was uh, so envious of his brothers and his father that he killed his brother and took his father and put him in jail in a way that Aurangzeb had uh, built this beautiful tribute to his wife as an honor to her, which is known as the Taj Mahal today. You can see it there in Delhi, the Taj Mahal. But uh, Aurangzeb, his father, uh, his father's name was Sajahan. So he took his father, Sajahan, and threw him in jail and put the window of the jail on the opposite side of the palace that he built for his wife or his own mother, in this case. So he could not, he would be right next to it, but couldn't see it. This was uh, a run set. Now you see, when people become avaricious or greedy, they'll do anything. Fill their lusty and greedy ambitions. The Arasner is in a similar situation. Whereas now he's lost everything and cruel death is approaching very quickly. One who is a great saddle can understand past, present, and future. And this was the case with Vidura. Vidura is not an ordinary person. He's actually Yamaraj come again in the form of Vidura, the younger brother of Vidurastra and the well-wisher of the Pandavas. And uh, he knows past, present, and future. And so he's warning him that soon you will die and you'll have to enter into a hellish situation. So get out of here quickly. Make your trek to the holy places, purify your life, and free yourself from an inauspicious future. And so he's speaking strongly, he said, and he, he's also a little facetious in a very sarcastic, sarcastic way. My dear king, he's saying. He's not a king. Vitarastra is not a king, but he's saying that because Vitarastra thinks he's a king. Just to let him know that he's not. <laughs> so he's making these, these statements. So, um, but this, when we look at this, we understand that. Many times we waste time in material life hanging on to things that really can't give us any real happiness or build any future upon. We get attached to something material. <laughs> and the family members, friends, our position, uh, our, our, uh, our social arrangements, our economic arrangements. And we forget that you know, death is coming, but it is. It comes for everyone. As long as the material body is there, death is, is something we have to have. We'll make an appointment. That is inevitable. But one who is Krishna conscious for death, then that's just the door to eternal life. But one who is materialistic, it's the most fearful thing in the world because they lose everything, including their material body and the attachments that they live for. So, uh, therefore, as Prabhupada writes in the phrase first sentence, cruel death cares for no one. No one is spared because it's just the way life is. It brings in such a way that when you're born, your death is already comes with your birth. It's already there. It's not something you have to wait until it, it comes. It comes. It's coming. And Prabhupada was in Africa. He was in, I believe he was in Johannesburg. He was talking on this subject. And he said to one young man who was there, he said, Hello, what is your age? The man said, I'm 22. And Prabhupada said, yes, means you're 22 years dead. Which means that as soon as you take birth, time is ticking away. So death is coming closer at every second, although it's imperceptible. We, and we don't even think about it. We go on with our life. Therefore, 
here is a reminder from someone who in his actual spiritual identity is the Lord of death, Yamaraj himself, who has now appeared as the Dura. He punishes the conditioned souls after they come to him, after they leave their body in the material world. So um, the sages, the saints, the great, some uh, the great souls, the spiritual masters, their duty is to awaken people to the reality and not to allow them to uh, think that life in this material world is uh, eternal because everyone thinks like that. Yamara, not I'm sorry, not you, but Yudas there. When Yudas there was in the forest with his um, with his brothers, they were in exile. This was all Duryodhana's uh, plan to destroy the Pandavas. Uh, they were exiled into the forest for twelve years, or thirteen years, thirteen years, and uh, they were struggling to maintain themselves. They had to live on whatever was available in the forest. Fortunately, Draupadi was there. And Draupadi, being the common wife of all the Pandavas, had a particular pot, which was called her magic pot. And whatever she gathered from the forest and cooked it would be enough for anyone and any amount of guests that would come as long as she didn't eat. As soon as she ate, that would be the end of whatever was there. And so they had enough, but it was simple. Forest vegetables, roots, and things that they that one can learn to live on in the forest. But one time they were all thirsty. And uh, uh, they wanted to get some water. They had, they couldn't, they needed some water. So um, the five brothers were there. So Sahadev went out to look for water. And when he came, he came across this beautiful, clear, sparkling, clean water pond. And he was thinking, oh, here it is. Now, his duty was to come back and tell all the others, but he was so thirsty that he decided to drink some water himself. When he was getting down to drink, he hears a voice coming from the sky. Stop. Do not drink that water. If you do, now this, is, this is my pond. If you drink that water, you will die. But being so thirsty, he completely ignored the voice. He drank the water and died. And one by one, the Pandavas were coming out and they all came to the same place. Then Nakul, then Bhima, and Arjun, they all went through the same thing, heard the same voice, ignored the voice, drank the water and died. Now, all the Pandavas were dead, except Yudhisthira. Yudhisthira is all alone now, and he's going out to look for his brothers, comes to the same pond, sees them all laying there, and he's wondering, are they sleeping? Or... And then he's also overcome with thirst, and he's about to drink, and he hears that same voice. This is my pond. Do not drink the water. If you do, you will die. Yudhisthira was very strongly self-controlled, so he stopped and he said, who are you? Why are you speaking in this way? He said, I am Dharmaraj, or actually Yamaraj. And uh, before, before you can drink the water, you have to ask, answer all of my questions. And he said, well, what is your questions? And this is mentioned in the Mahabharata, there were 50 questions. And Yudhisthira expertly answered all of the questions. And two of the questions I remember, one is very significant. One was, what is more numerous 
than the blades of grass in creation? And the answer was given by Yudhisthira, the thoughts in the minds of men. And then the last question came, what is the most amazing thing in this world? Yudhisthira also understood. He said, the most amazing thing in this world is everyone is seeing their friends, family members, and people in general are dying. But they're thinking, not me. It will not happen to me. <laughs> when he answered that question, then the voice revealed himself as his father, because Vidura actually is Yamaraj, the father of Yudhisthira. And he said, because you have answered my question so nicely, I can see you are very wise. I give you a benediction that you can ask for one of your brothers to come back alive again. So he had, so Yudhisthira is thinking, there was Arjun, there was Bhim, Nakul, Sahadev. So uh, Yudhisthira answered the question, please give life to Nakul. And when Yamaraj, in the form of the Yaksha, heard that, he was surprised. Oh, you asked for Nakul? You will be fighting the battle of Kurukshetra battle soon. Why didn't you ask for Arjun or Bhima? Yudhisthira replied in a very compassionate way. He said, I am the son of Kunti, along with uh, my brother Arjun and Bhima. Nukul and Sahade were the sons of Madhu, who were the second wife of Pandu. When Pandu died, Madhuri entered into the Saki life and gave up her life also to follow her husband. Therefore, I wanted to allow one of the sons of, of Madhuri to live. When Yamaraj heard that, the Aksha, he was amazed to see the compassion of Yudhisthira. He said, because you are so righteous and so concerned of the welfare of others, I will give life to all of your brothers. Again. <laughs> and so they all woke up as if they were waking up from sleep. They did not remember that they actually had died. So, that question, which was the last question out of the 50 questions, you can read it in the Mahabharata, there is a section of it, it was really the foundation for people's way of living. People don't want to think about that and even talk about it. They like nothing. They want to go on with their life as if life is eternal. But life is eternal. And the fact that eternality exists within our our nature, we have this desire to live forever. And it's a fact, the soul is eternal. And we are the soul, part and parts of the Christian self. We have eternal life, but not in this body. Not in this body. So um, therefore it's natural to want to live forever. It's natural not to want to die because it is not our nature to die. It's our nature to live eternally. So when can he live eternally? In the realm of spirit and not in this phenomenal, as it says here, Prabhupada says, flimsy material world. Flimsy is a word that kind of like says that there's no substance to it. It doesn't have any substance because everyone is struggling to exist. No one is actually enjoying life because their enjoyment is simply struggle, 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 struggle to, to maintain, struggle to exist, struggle to um, continue. So this is the nature of this material world. It's simply 
struggle and because it is contrary to our eternal existence as spiritual beings. Therefore, Vidura is most compassionate. He was already in the forest and he was, he had met Maitreya and he had received instructions from Maitreya on eternal religious principles. He had become fully self-realized and he had no business coming back to the family. He had already left. He was thrown out of the house by Duryodhan, who insulted him. And he took that opportunity to leave and take up spiritual life. But now he's coming back only for one reason, for his brother, Dhritarashtra, and simply to try to remind him of what is the actual purpose of life and how to achieve it. So the great sages, souls, gurus, and others, their only concern is to give this life-giving knowledge to the conditioned souls to save them from their hellish existence, which awaits them as long as they continue in their material pursuits. And so that is the nature of Vidura. So we're seeing the end. Here it mentions that he didn't, although Yudhisthira was there, he didn't preach to Yudhisthira because he understood that Yudhisthira in due course of time will understand what is the right thing to do and he will also leave his position. Although now he has just become the king of the world. So, and therefore Prabhupada says, you know, time and tide wait for no man. You can, whether you're a king or whoever you are, whatever you are, everything in this world is under the influence of eternal time. And as it says here, time and time obey nobody's orders. <laughs> they work according to the order of the time maker, which is Krishna himself. Therefore, time is actually the manifestation of Krishna in this material world to move people towards eternal life. Now, this is a very interesting, you, you'll find this particular chapter is full of many of the details of the, the whole intrigue that's centered around this family feud between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. And ultimately, how Krishna weaves his way through this to ultimately inspire everyone towards God consciousness. Okay, so Harikishna Maharaj, thank you so much for the class. Dear devotees, any questions or comments? You can please go ahead and raise your hand. Or you can type in the chat window. I can read for you. Uh, please turn on your cameras if possible. It would be very nice to see all of you. And uh, yeah. Maharaj, while others are thinking, um, I was I was thinking like uh, Dhritarashtra, he heard Bhagavad Gita and uh, he's. Uh, um, he how can he be uh, the Maharaj Yudhishthir and uh, how can he um, uh, be enjoying the still the um, material things or the kingly things in the palace and everything and uh, until Vidura came he, he, he didn't realize even uh, that I should not be here I should get out of here he didn't even realize that part um, that point yeah this is the nature of material attachment Rabba talks about now the man is dying on his deathbed. He's surrounded by his family members and he's giving them instructions how what to do, how to maintain the family, how to carry on the business and everything. He's not going to be there. <laughs> but he's so instead of thinking about where he's going and he's still trying to make plans on the same level that he's dying from. So this is the pitiable nature of the conditioned souls. Their attachments carry with them all the way up to the point of death. And even when they're dying, they're still thinking 
how will things go on without me? <laughs> things will go on, don't worry. <laughs> So that's 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 the foolishness of the different souls. Now that's the nature of material attachments. We get so attached to something that no matter what, we cannot hear any good instructions. Even Dhritarashtra admitted that. And he said that we we do her. I know what you're, you know. No, he actually said that to. Uh, what did he say? Yeah, he said it to we do I know what you're telling me is correct. But I can't I can't follow it mm. because of attachments. <laughs> the cigarette pack package says if you smoke, you get emphysema, lung cancer, you know, complications in pregnancy and pregnancy. It also causes you death. Still, <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Yeah, it's very difficult uh, attachments. But um, sometimes um, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, um, I feel that sometimes we feel very much uh, uh, detached. Sometimes, and um, what did say? Um, I don't know how to express that. Uh, sometimes we get fed up of all these things and we thought we'll we'll think that we'll leave this and go away <laughs> like that some thoughts will come every time um, um here and there <laughs> they're reminding you what material life is like yeah. but again we'll console ourselves and again come back to the same situation <laughs> again well, and again it's not that you give up your material responsibilities, but you have to do it in a detached way. Yeah. That's the art. You're doing what? You're taking care of your body and the extensions of the body in the form of family members and others, but in a detached way, you do it as a duty. Mm -hmm. Just like we dutifully take a bath every day. <laughs> Sometimes we we spend we have to spend so much time getting clean and we think, boy, I could use that time for something else. But if we don't do that, then there'll be a problem for us and others. But we do it. It's something we have to do. We have to sometimes the devotees think, why should I sleep? I'm wasting time. But still, we might need sleep in order to fortify the body, in order to continue on in our devotion. So there's things we have to do in order to maintain our position in this material world. But then again, as time goes on, one is meant to detach themselves from all of those things. And towards the end of life, especially particularly for the Grihasta, they have to retire from all of those family responsibilities and then make their attachment simply on Krishna 100%. You can do it at any age, but you have to also understand how to do it. And that, that's easy. The spiritual master gives me the instruction. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Did you notice any questions or comments? Um, you can please raise your hand. No, no, today everyone is very silent. No questions, Maharaj. <laughs> Moni Baba. <laughs> But um, I feel that this is a very uh, good culture where um, the saints come to the grihasthas and uh, they tell them uh, about this material world and real, make them realize uh, how, how much they are attached and uh, um, uh, giving them spiritual knowledge. So this is very important and very, um, very essential, right, Maharaj? Yeah. The most essential thing. Yeah. 
because what is the purpose of human life? The scriptures give us the understanding. Adato Brahma Jigyasa. Now in the human form of life, understand your relationship with the Supreme Lord. That is the purpose of life. And it's not something that is parallel to everything else. It is the goal of life. We, tra we traverse through all 8 million species of life until we get to the human form. We have been in so many lower species of life. Aquatics, insects, plants, trees, birds, animals. Now when we get to the human form of life, there's a chance to get out of this cycle of birth and death and actually attain to perfection in the relationship with Krishna. This material world is set up in such a way as to um, cause us to take birth after birth until we actually come to the point of uh, self-realization. The human form of life is meant for that. You can't do it in the lower speed. Now, this is the this is the goal of human life is to become God conscious, fully God conscious. And therefore, we have to take up the process seriously and not simply as just part of life. It is life itself. When we're young and we're in good health, you know, everything seems to be going okay. When we hear these instructions, we think they're not relevant for me, but they're relevant for everyone in any, in any situation in life. Because everyone is under the influence of pain. Mm -hmm. This matters. Yeah. It's the most important instruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When uh, Sutta Goswami Sukadev Goswami was asked questions by Maharaj Pariksit. He said uh, two questions that were very much appreciated by Sukadev Goswami, which he mentions at the visit. What is the duty of a man about to die? Of course, in Maharaj Pariksit's case, he knew he was going to die in a few days. And then what is the actual goal of life? He asked these two questions. And Sukadev Goswami, when he heard these questions, he became really inspired. He said, thank you for asking. This is the most important question. And he's answered by saying, what is the duty of a man about to die? And he said, actually, this applies to everyone because everyone is, on, is under the influence of death. And what is the goal of life or purpose of life? And then that became discussion, which plays itself as the entire human environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj, thank you so much. Um, there is a question on chat um, by Narsingha Lila, Lila Mataji. She's asking, um, Hare Krishna, what is the difference between reading Srimad Bhagavatam with an intention to serve the Srimad Bhagavatam and with the intention to enjoy the topics. Thank you. Well, if you're in the enjoying mood, you won't you won't be able to see you won't be able to recognize the message of Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is enjoyable because spiritual life contains enjoyment and transcendental knowledge brings about mental inspiration, mental satisfaction, peace, happiness and realization of our position and knowledge of the Supreme. So all of that's there. But when we read it in the mood of service, then it reveals itself in a, in a very personal way and how best we can serve and how, how best we can use our time. We're, if we're reading in an enjoying mood, that's okay too. I mean, it's, a, it's naturally enjoying. But when we read it in the mood of trying to understand deeper, how can I gain 
in my position as an eternal servant of the Lord by, by this knowledge I'm coming in contact with, then we're actually looking for something in the pages of Bhagavatam. And then Krishna, seeing our desire, will help us understand what we need to um, what we need to know. Because Krishna, Krishna will fulfill your desire. Even if you're reading it with enjoying, you're gonna you're gonna get both in some enjoyment and at the same time you'll get knowledge. But when you're actually looking for that knowledge, which is which is pertinent to your position in growing in your spiritual life, then you'll see these things. You may not recognize them when you are reading. That's why devotees read Bhagavatam over and over again. And when they read each time, they always say, I'm reading it for the first time. This is common experience. Whether it's Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, or any of the other major scriptures, when we read each time we read it, it's like an experience. It's the first time. Why? Because each time um, it reveals itself more and more as we continue to stay in contact with the transcendental mind. But if you have the intention or the desire to learn from the position of growing in spiritual life, then that knowledge will be you'll be able to recognize it and experience it automatically. Because Bhagavatam is, is like a kalpa riksha. In the spiritual world, there are trees called kalpa riksha, which anyone can get any desire to fulfill simply by going to that tree. So this tree can fulfill all desires. So Bhagavatam is also called the kalpa riksha tree. It can fulfill all desires. There's people who read Bhagavatam in order to improve their material life and they will get something from Bhagavatam in that way also. Because that's what they're looking for. Mataji is saying, thank you. I have heard in lecture, we can't study Srimad Bhagavatam. We are objects of mercy of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah, because it's Krishna in literary incarnation. Bhagavatam is not different than Krishna. It's called the literary incarnation of the Supreme Personality of God. It's coming in, we're coming in contact with Krishna directly through transcendental knowledge. Every word in Bhagavatam is full of meaning. Therefore, you can't exhaust the meaning of Bhagavatam even for millions of lifetimes. You can read it over and over again. And each time you will you'll see or notice something that you didn't notice the previous time. It's like that. It's amazing. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Um, dear devotees, any more questions or comments? <clears throat> um, Maharaj, I have a question, like uh, I was thinking this about death. So why is it so, uh, so even though, um, so do it, I do, I, I even can't imagine on the stage at the time how I feel like um, it's by thinking about death itself, it's very fearful for everyone. So, but uh, you say that devotees uh, can't be fearful. They, uh, they are, they know that they will be changing the bodies, but um, but some, some curiosity will be there and something will be happening out of this world. We don't know. So how can not be one be fearful about death, Maharaj? Like what will be that stage? I'm not able to imagine at all. So. Well, our fearfulness comes 
in different ways. Some people are afraid of death because it's, they, they think it's painful. And for the materialists, it's very painful. Um, some people are afraid of death because of the unknown. Most people are afraid of death because they don't want to lose their attachments in this world. So people go through different fear processes based on their, you know, perception of what death means. And some people are at peace with themselves and say, yes, death will come. And so for a devotee, devotee wants to make sure that they're ready for death by using their time now to become fully Krishna conscious. That's all devotees come to me. I have to leave this body, so let me leave in the in the in the in, in pure Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> that's what that's the only devotee with the devotees. Hare And there's always the fear of the unknown. That's there in the life. Continue. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Um, devotees. So, uh, Maharaj, I was um, like uh, um, recently my mother's sister passed away. So I was contemplating, or I was thinking, like uh, um, when when she was about to uh, leave her body, um, not not about to leave her, but be before just uh, one week before, she she became very silent and she is not talking and uh, she is not responding much. So what will be happening at that time um, before death? Um, I was so curious to know. Um, so that's why I'm asking uh, this question. Hmm. She was conscious? Little bit, not that much, but um, maybe she's understanding whatever it is, uh, whatever is happening around her um, with all her um, children around her. and But... Uh, she was very silent she was not talking she was just into like trance or some other stage um, yeah. she was i don't know i could probably of course i can, can't say for sure unless i'm there personally mm -hmm. usually what happens marriage um before death like some i i heard that they all um go into that stage before death um She's becoming detached from all of the things in this world. She's no longer interested in talking about everything that she lived for. Now she's becoming finding peace within herself. Mm -hmm. Trying to more or less come to the come to the understanding that soon I will I will leave this body. Kind of a silence is just silence towards material life now. What is the use? It's becoming more peaceful. And that's for people who are pious, except for some people who are pious, that's what happens. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Maharaj, um, where can we read about this uh, particular topic like um, Srila Prabhupada mentioned somewhere and Bhagavata? Yeah. Maharaj? What topic are you referring to? Yeah, about death, um, especially like... Um, 
Talk, different verses about death. Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Give me a minute here. I'm going to go into my... notes here and I'll give you some information right away. Thank you, Maharaj. You can tell you can devotees can write these down into some verses. Yeah. If anybody are interested in it, it's not done. I'll type in the chat window also. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, let's see. I have I have three references. Death of a pure devotee is from Srimad Bhagavatam 1624. Yeah. Death and the influence of time is one. This is what we're reading now. 113, 18 through 22. So this topic will continue for the next three verses. Four verses. Uh, let's see where else. Um, there are many other verses. This is all I have. One more. The, the death sentence that's given to a person who commits crime is 1737, but that's a different aspect. Yeah. Um, death is called. Um, the herdsman. The herdsman. The herdsman takes his flock of animals and moves them from one pasture to another. Death is moving the soul from one situation to another. So he's called a herdsman. He's called immovable. Therefore, he is fixed. He's called. Uh, what is it called? Immovable. imperceptible and so death is all around but still we don't perceive it death is called imperceptible immovable oh, no, it's, there's other terminologies for death mm -hmm. death is, in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says mitya sarva harasya hum I think that's in the 11th chapter I am I am death Death is me. <laughs> so, uh, these are the only two references I have. Yes, Mother, thank you so much. I think the next four verses, 21, 19, 21, and 22, next three verses, mm -hmm. are uh, 19, 20, 21, and 22, next four verses are about death. Yes, Maharaj, yeah, yeah. This will be the subject matter for the next few days. Mm. Okay. Um, let's see what else. There are other, other references. In the 11th canto, Krishna speaks about it, particularly in the 12th canto. Mm. Mention in relationship to Maharaj Prakshad leaving his body. We have died so many times already. So death for us is not, not something new. And the only thing is we we don't have any re recollections of our previous death. And we don't have any recollections of our previous lives either. And that is Krishna's arrangement so the soul can focus on what is going on now. Because what is in the present is important. Okay. So we forget our past lives, our past deaths, life after life. Sometimes in dreams, people can re experience their past death. You know, that happens sometimes. Or under hypnosis. Mm -hmm. If you want to read something really good that will help,
in Bhakti Tirtha Swami's Beggar Number Four. He wrote a series called The Beggar. One, two, three, and four. Number four is all about as he's preparing to leave the world, he's writing about it. <laughs> That's that's a very powerful book. Hmm. It's called Die Before Dying. Which means die to those things that that is preventing us from dying in the in a in the Krishna conscious way. Really good. Died before dying. Then there is the book by uh, by uh, Giri Raj Swami, and there's a book by Bhakti Purushottam Maharaj. Both of these have pen the book. Wait a minute. I'll be right back. Yes, ma'am. Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Krishna. So, can you see me? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Can you see this? Yeah, Maharaj, a little bit towards your left. This, this way? This, this, this side, that other side. So this is Gary right? A little, little bit more. Life's final exam. Yeah, yes, even I have this book. I didn't start reading yet. <laughs> Yes, yeah. now I remember Maharaj, yeah. This is by Giri Raj Swami. Yes. Life exam, death and dying from the Vedic perspective. This is Bhakti Purushottam Swami's book, Death and the Final Fall. Maharaj, a little bit down. More, still more. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. This is by Bhakti Purushottam Maharaj. Okay. Right. Thank you, Maharaj. And then the one by Bhakti Kirtha Swami called Die Before Dying, Beggar for. Oh, Beggar for. Thank you, Thank you so much. I'll read you something. Death removes everything that is false. Death reveals to us our true friends. Death exposes our true priorities. Death brings forth wisdom. Death educates us on our fears and weaknesses. But most important, death reminds us. That, that these material bodies and material universes are not our home. Since death is calling you, don't fear or hide, but present yourself and see what she has to offer. After all, she is a just, faithful, and loyal servant, Krishna. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing us, showing me this. Thank you. Yeah, so. I be I have that book by Kirira Swamaraj. I I forgot totally. Yeah. I'll read something from found from Richard Rose, founder of the Sacred Art of Living Center, author of the American Book of Living and Dying. Life's final exam, and referring to this book, opens a world of new insights into the mysteries of life, death, and what lies beyond. The book contains answers to life's biggest questions. Things through the eyes of love, devotion, and service. 
Shirad Swami weaves the perennial wisdom of the Vedic tradition, which is now very well known in the West, with practical experience and support for those working in hospice and for anyone who cares for others at the great threshold. Regardless of a person's spiritual path, life's final exam offers fresh perspectives on what we all hope for and most cherish in life. Here is a new volume to the growing world library of the book of the living and the dying. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's from a secular person, but you know, Yes, yeah. So these are three books that um, give us an insight. Krishna's words throughout the Shastras, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam are also insightful. You can see how Kadamba Kanana Maharaj accepted the situation in a very royal way. He knew it was coming. Simply stopped all activities, went to Vrindavan, didn't stop his service, but was just planning his life in such a way that he would be ready for the time when death really would come. There was no fear. At the same time, he was still giving knowledge to people in general. So a devotee doesn't think, oh, I'm dying. I should retract from the world. I should hide away. I should, you know. There was this uh, there was this TV show many years ago when I was young, before I joined the Hare Krishna movement. It's called, it was called, what was the name of that show? Uh, um, I can't remember the name of the show. It was interesting. It had an interesting title. And it was called... Uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of the show. But the theme of the show was this man was given a death notice of one year. Oh, it was called Run For Your Life. And he had one year to live. And so what he was doing, each show was that one show would be him scuba diving with beautiful girls. Next show would be him climbing mountains with beautiful girls. Next show would be him, you know, driving around in a race car with beautiful girls. So it was the same thing with beautiful girls in every one of the shows. And uh, it was called Run for Your Life. It became such a popular show that after one year, they extended his life so they could continue the show. <laughs> Which was ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is what the materialists do. One of my disciples, he was doing book distribution. And he met a man who had terminal cancer. He was trying to give him a book and tell him this will really help you at the time when you're leaving the body. He said, no, no, I'm just going to go. I have a lot of money. I'm just going to enjoy as much as I can before I leave. <laughs> this is the foolishness. They're not enjoying now. I mean, they think now they're going to enjoy just because they're leaving. What are they enjoying? They're enjoying this dead corpse. The corpse is already the thing is already dead. It's just a matter of time before the soul exits the body. So a devotee, it says here in the Bhakti Tirtha Swami meditation on the beggar is really powerful. Out of all of these books, I recommend that one. Well, of course, they're all good, but you know, Bhakti Puru Shokan Maharaj really pulls together a lot of stories related to death.
Section one, which has five chapters for understanding death. Section two, which has 14 chapters as overcoming death. Section three has three sections for hell after death. Section four has four sections, death in the Lord. Section five is glorious departures. That has uh, seven sections. And then there's six appendix, appendixes, which also covers the subject matter. And this is also a really interesting book. Yes, Maharaji. Thank you so much. The devotee doesn't have fear of death, they have fear of wasting time. Greater fear. Thank you, Maharaj. So we are over past one hour, so I guess uh, we can end the call here. So yeah. if there are no more questions or comments. Um, thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, tomorrow is Sunday. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. And uh, one more thing, Guru Maharaj, like um, Shamlal Prabhu asked me to ask you, like, are you using the microphone which he has given, um, the new one? Oh, I got it sitting on my desk right next to me and I forgot to plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to change uh, the settings uh, in the Zoom uh, when you are attaching that to the computer. So um, you have to do that before class, Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah, I just neglected to hook it up, but all right, we'll do it tomorrow. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, and also, um, you were about to give a class about how to give a class um, on the particular topic. So if you can please let me know like which day you can give class, I can announce to the devotees. Uh, I'll try to do it. I'll give you at least a week's notice so everyone can be prepared for that. Right. Yeah. I think it's very essential. Many devotees as possible can come to that. That's not it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's important to know. Because we want everyone to know this philosophy and actually be able to speak it. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, all devotees. Dear devotees, we can we'll meet again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Shri Prabhupad ki jai. Jimat Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Thank you so much. Everyone, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for the lecture. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.